that'd be better. Yeah, okay. Uh, the combined authority allows filming um, at its public meeting, so feel free to take pictures and use social media during the meeting. Um, and if I can ask everybody to turn off their mobile phones, uh, put them onto silent or vibrate while the meeting takes place. Thank you. Um, got no fire drills organised today, and um, if we do, then we'll have to evacuate and go onto the high street. So, uh, okay. So this this uh, committee was called the housing committee, but um, has changed changed its remit now because um, delivery of housing is no longer a pr primary function of the combined authority. So we've now been uh, rebranded as the Cambridgeshire and Peterborough Combined Authority Environment and Sustainable Communities Committee, actually with a much, much broader and much more interesting brief than the previous committee. So it's, I, I actually think it's the most exciting of all the uh, Combined Authority Committees. So, uh, so thank you very much to those, uh, those new members who've joined us. Um, so... Yes, I think I'm told this actually incorporates the Housing Communities Committee, um, but it also includes now two new business board representatives, uh, Belinda Clark and Tina Bardsby, Bar Barbsby, uh, neither of whom appear to be here, but um, you know, perhaps, they'll, perhaps they'll rock up a bit late. Uh, so if we get cracking on the agenda, um, do we have any apologies for absence, Joanna, please? Uh, thank you, Chair. Yes, we have apologies for absence from um, the Mayor, from Councillor Laws and um, Linda Clark, um, and also from Councillor Simons, and we have Councillor Hussein um, substituting for them. Thank you very much, and thank you, Councillor Hussein, for uh, for subbing. Uh, jolly good. So, item two is the election of a vice chair for the committee. Um, I've had one of, one expression of interest from Councillor Lara Davenport Ray so far. Is there anybody else interested in being a vice chair? Do I have a nominate, nominator for Councillor Lara Davenport Ray? Thank you very much. And a seconder from Councillor Goodyear. So thank you. So Councillor Hussein nominating Councillor Goodyear. Um, seconding? Sorry. It's good Earl. Good Earl. Sorry. I, my wrong glasses. My, my apologies. <laughs> So, read the good bit and just assume it's got year after it, so I'm sorry. Um, so, I, can I take, uh, take that as uh, affirmative from everybody that they approve that? Agreed? Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Um, so, the next item is the draft minutes. And I think it was, I was probably the only person here, um, so I'm happy to approve the minutes as uh, an accurate record. Okay, jolly good. And item four, public... Is that all right? Uh, Adrian, wasn't there a matter in the minutes that uh, needed to be uh, clarified? Oh. So we've got the um, statement to... Oh, I'm sorry. That's under actions. I'm romping through these without... Right, then, so... So item 90, so just going back to the minutes, okay, item 90... 95, the Housing Loads, Loans Report, where an action was identified to request that the audit report on the housing loans be circulated to the committee. Um, so this action was considered inappropriate, as no such report has been circulated to members of the Audit and Governance Committee. However, draft minutes from the Overview and Scrutiny Committee of the 20th of March 23 record that the Housing and Communities Committee had initiated a review into the housing loans, which would complete the internal order review of the whole of the affordable housing programme. Councillor van der Weyer suggested that it would benefit the work of the overview and scrutiny committee if that committee could be consulted on the scope of the remaining review. So a review of loan activities will be conducted when the matter of the remaining loans concludes, as stated in paragraph 5.1 of the housing loans report being heard later today on the agenda. Probably left everybody really confused, but we can pick it up later when we talk about the, the reviews. Okay. All right. Sorry for jumping over that. Okay. Moving on to item four. Public, do we have any public questions, please, Joanna? Uh, no, Chair. No, none have been received. Thank you. And item five is the, uh, house, the affordable housing programme. And Asma is going to uh, report on this. Is it? Am I on? Oh, oh there we go. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, good morning, councillors, and uh, good morning, uh, Councillor Bridget um, Smith. 
Right, I will talk about um, the delivery and implementation of uh, the affordable housing programme. Currently, as it says in the report, there's 605 units. Actually, we had a few units come in recently. So now we are up to 622. That was Drake Avenue, uh, which completed on the 31st of May. We have a further 830 plus units still to deliver. There has still been some issues with slippages, delays with utilities, obtaining materials, and obviously cost of living with most of our providers who are our third parties providing the housing. Uh, we've had some completions in Appendix 2, which shows that uh, the units with Cross Keys homes on the sites of British Sugar Way and Perkins Phase 2 are being delivered. And we're hoping that completion for these two big sites will be September 2023. Finally, CKH have said they've had other difficulties with physical starts on sites. They're now all progressing very well. I attended Stand Ground on Friday, and that is all on site, so I'm really pleased to say that they are going to deliver that housing soon. I've also been to Great Haddon, which will be completed in mid-2025, which was discussed in the last committee. And this is because of the road layouts that are being delivered by uh, different providers, so the housing has to wait until the roads are in. Uh, progress on Alconbury Weald has had some delays with utilities, staffing and material delays, but they are all now catching up, so that's good news to, from that point of view. And um, just a word on HALO, they've come to a final herds of terms agreed, and the final GFA will be signed for the 46 units at, with Alison Holmes and Keepmalt. And also their issues with uh, the regulator of social housing uh, to upgrade their governance and viability ratings is still ongoing, but that's moving in the right direction. They've got some action plans provided to Roche, and they're working their way into upgrading their grading by the end of this financial calendar year. Sorry. Thank, thank you, As Asma. Uh, GFA grant funding agreement. Yes. Beg yes. your pardon. Sorry okay, for the acronym. Right, okay. <laughs> okay. Um, are there any questions on this? Asma spends half her life on building sites, making you know, holding people to account and making sure these houses are actually being built. So she keeps a really, really close eye on everyone. Uh, Councillor Dupre and then Councillor Davenport Ray and then Councillor Todd Jones. There we are. Is that on now? Um, yes. Just uh, I had two specific questions. I think you answered one of them, which was Drake Avenue. The other one was <coughs> on page 16, Whittlesey Green, um, etc. cetera, uh, the second um, line of that, that page of the table, um, which was a completion date of the 1st of April 2023, uh, and paid to date is 846 out of 1.36 million. Um, is that... What's the explanation for, for that? What have I missed? Sorry, keeps going off. Uh, no, uh, to date, there has been movement with that project in the sense that some of the, pro uh, the units on that site, there are additional ones going on there. So that hasn't been updated as accordingly, but there is further units going on that site, especially in Whittlesey Green and Harriers West. Councillor Davenport Ray. Keep you need to hold it down, the middle one hold it down, and then the red light comes on. If you can turn yours off as oh, asthma. Uh, I might might need a different um, microphone here. Oh, no, we're there. We're there. Thank you. Solved it. <laughs> Thank you. I was reviewing Appendix 2, um, which has a list of different um, affordable housing programs and the implementation dates and delivery so far. Uh, so in total, it has uh, 47 completions out of 716. And some of the completion dates are uh, farther off, but some are um, this month. Do you, is that the level of progress you were hoping to see by this point, or do you see any challenges there? And, and what, are your, what is your plan if you do see challenges? 
think the one that you're referring to that was supposed to complete this month in Girton, and we've had real problems there. Um, it was supposed to be delivered by the end of this month, June. Uh, they've had issues with windows. Some of them have been replaced and they are ready to let, but we're still having three other problems, problem windows, shall we put it, and they've been pushed to September. I need to update that because at the time of doing the report, I was notified that it was going to be at the end of this month. Um, but unfortunately, I've just had an email on Friday saying that three units are still outstanding. Yep, John, come back. And British Sugar Way in Peterborough. Do you have any updates on that one? All I've been told is that will complete in September 2023. It is spearheading ahead quite quickly. So is Perkins. Uh, I've been advised by um, Cross Keys that it is going to complete in September 23. I've been also on site as well in my muddy boots and hat. And uh, it is going very well, actually. I'm quite pleased with that. Okay, thank you. Um, Councillor Todd Jones. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Networking? Yep. Um, yeah, just a quick query on um, the kind of um, rather um, uh, sort of newbie question, really. Um, on the appendices, the first part of Appendix 1, Appendix 1, there are figures in bold in the page to date column, and I think they all relate to what was luminous. Um, is there any particular explanation to that? At the time of the report, the payments were going through. They hadn't actually gone through yet, so that's why they were in bold, just to remind me, and probably yourselves, who's picked up that these payments were going through as we speak. They're now being paid. So hopefully that will be removed in the next time we meet again. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Um, any more questions? Yes, Councillor Hussein. Sorry, Chair, it's just um, I've had some updated figures from officers probably from um, the past, after your report maybe, because I've been told that there's 24 units that have been delivered at the Perkins site and 27 at the uh, Sugar Way site. Oh, sorry. So I've been, officers have told me that there's 27 uh, units that have been delivered at the Sugar Way site, but on here it's saying 10. I've not been notified as such, so yeah, that might be because of delaying responses from CKH. Thank you, I will take note of that. Thank you, thank you very much indeed. So, so I mean, the reason for some of the um, extended um, final completion dates are COVID got in the way, um, all the issues with supply, supply chains and so on, which have been, you know, across just about every aspect of construction, hasn't it? Everything from fence panels to cement to bricks to, Yes, to windows, obviously, as well. So, um, so I think you know, I think Asma's done a very good job in keeping these all, you know, reasonably reasonably on track and uh, keeping a very close eye on them. So that obviously minimising any risk to the authority. So thank you very much, Asma. Um, so we're required to note the report. Is everybody happy to do that? Okay, the report is noted. Then thank you. Uh, so the next item is the community home support and. Um, just get my right bit. So, uh, so Nick Sweeney is going to in introduce this report. Thank you, Chair. Uh, good morning, members. In March 2023, a recommendation was made to the former Housing and Communities Committee to discontinue supporting community homes groups because there had been no take up of the £5,000 startup grants that were approved in 2001, and no applications had been received for technical support funding from the £100,000 that was made available from October 2022. Members agreed to defer a decision to enable a consultation exercise to take place. So a letter was sent to constituents, local housing authorities, the Combined Authorities Consultant, Eastern Community Homes and Community Homes Groups. And a document containing the full responses can be found at Appendix A. The only constituent local housing authority to oppose the proposal was East Cambridgeshire District Council that provides an independent support service to groups within East Cambridgeshire. No applications for grant funding 
have been received from groups within East Cambridgeshire and officers were made fully aware of the funding availability. Eastern Community Homes provide support on behalf of the combined authority and they oppose the proposal for a variety of reasons, including high housing costs, poor access to housing, missed opportunities and the lack of support for community homes groups. Great Staunton Community Land Trust opposes the proposal explaining that community homes projects take a long time to progress. It takes a city community land trust explain that there is a lack of supporting documentation available and suggest it would help if more resources was available. Water Beach Community Land Trust advised that the funding had not been well publicised and they had not been made aware of the funding availability. The response highlights the problems of scarce land availability and affordability. However, they would like funding to continue as they may want to submit an application in the future. So the recommendation before members is to recommend to the Combined Authorities Board that the Combined Authority discontinues providing a support service and further grant funding to community homes groups from the 31st of July 2023 and to authorise an extension of the agreement with Eastern Community Homes from the 30th of June 2023 to 31st of July 2023 on existing terms to enable continued support until the board is able to consider the proposal at its meeting in late July. And that concludes my presentation. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much indeed. So for clarification, uh, this committee is required to make a recommendation to the board that then needs to get ratified at the board. Um, and also for clarification, my understanding is that when, uh, when the award was initially made to Eastern Community Homes, that it was on the understanding that they would be becoming financially sustainable in their own, their own right to the point where, I'm looking at Nick just to confirm that I'm right on this, that they would, they, would, uh, they would then start generating their own income so that they would no longer be solely reliant on grant funding. Uh, Eastern Community Homes um, provide a service, an outsourced service, um, at a cost of uh, approximately £2,000 a month. Um, there's never been any... Uh, it's been purely a commercial outsourcing arrangement. Um, I'm not aware of any sort of plans for them to stand on their own two feet. Okay. They're an established, no established subsidiary of Cam Cambridge Eureka, I think. So okay. they're an established my, organization. Okay, my, my mistake. I'm sorry that I misunderstood that. Okay, um, questions, points of clarification from members. Uh, Councillor Davenport Ray. Thank you, Nick. You said that when you reported to this committee in March that no applications had been received. I'm wondering if any applications have been received between then and now? And also, if uh, the board is minded to not discontinue the scheme, um, are, are there any learnings from the um, feedback you received of how we might do things differently in future? Thank you. Um, the first element of your question, sorry, you're gonna have to prompt me. Have you, have you received any applications since you came to this committee in March? Sorry about that, yes. Uh, next item on the agenda, we had a flurry of uh, applications uh, submitted late. Uh, we'll be discussing those later, so I don't want to preempt those applications. Um, but um, three, we had four applications, and only one of them is to be recommended for approval. So there has been a late flurry. Uh, as for lessons learned from the exercise, um, I suppose it's very difficult for community homes groups in this area um, because of land availability and affordability, uh, and particularly the Water Beach uh, comments um, say it all, really. It's, it's very difficult, and whenever they try and talk to developers, uh, they, they, they uh, get a, a viability sort of argument, and a lot of the, the land is committed anyway to developers. Um, there's certainly some uh, valid comments from It Takes a City on to uh, uh, whether, uh, onto the standard of support provided by Eastern Community Homes, that whether that could be improved, and also whether they could make themselves more available and some more documentation available. So I think there are um, service level issues uh, 
to, to take account of if the decision is is not, you know, it doesn't go forward. Thank you. Uh, Councillor um, Goodell. Thank you. I'd just like to ask, um, these new uh, applications, how will it affect them if we now close down the, uh, the, the grant? So that decision gets made at the board. So the decision to close down the funding stream won't be won't be ratified until the board meeting. Okay, so it's still so it's still open until the point at which the board make a decision to close it. That, that's correct. Yes, the service will continue until the thirty first of July. So we'll have time to issue uh, the, it, the any grants that are approved. Uh, before before then, or, or certainly if once they're approved, they can be. Um, issued. There isn't a, a, a problem there. Is that okay? Thank you. Councillor Todd Jones. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, so just to sort of confirm that you know, the sort of extension to the 31st of July uh, will cover the um, applications that were in, coming up in the following agenda item, where there's one for approval. I don't want to preempt what was going to be, what's going to be decided on that. But can I just ask about the, um, we've had this little flurry of applications. Um, is that um, a sort of implicit criticism of the publicizing of the community home support? Um, and are you satisfied that there's been enough um, uh, information and publicity to constituents authorities cascaded down to community home groups that everyone should have been aware of what is on offer from the combined authority? Uh, our consultant, Eastern Community Homes, was fully briefed uh, to uh, publicise the availability of funding uh, across the whole of Cambridgeshire and Peterborough, with the exception of East Cambridgeshire. Um, I mean, there's been some criticism of, of that, and that's a lesson learned. Um, so, yeah, I, I, you know, it's 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 not it's not good, um, but the the flurry of activity, um, it, and we're taking some. I'm not, I'm not going to preempt any decisions, but we're deciding on three loan applications, but it's not normal, or I certainly don't like taking a, a, a loan application to, or a grant application to committee and recommending it for refusal. What would normally happen is we'd work with the groups, work it up, get it to a stage whereby we were recommending approval. So it's disappointing that I'm here today recommending three very lately submitted grant applications for approval. That haven't been uh, they're, they're not good applications you know it's almost as if it's sort of been submitted just to say here you are thank you nick but can you also confirm that some awards were made quite some time ago and they've never been drawn down by the by the organizations to which they've been awarded and we haven't even been able to get in contact with some of these organizations that's correct there were two um five thousand pound startup grants uh, authorized by the former Housing and Communities Committee. Um, but there was the previous community homes team uh, hadn't produced uh, an audit proof way of issuing the grants. So what we did in, in, uh, in we, we produced a revised uh, document stating how grants were to be made and that allowed a two year window uh, to allow these groups to become incorporated and legally recognised. And then once they were incorporated, they could claim the grant money. But in that two-year window, none of the grants that were authorised came, so, so they they just had fallen by the wayside. There wasn't enough momentum to keep it going. But if they weren't legally incorporated, it would just be the same as giving £5,000 to groups of individuals. There's There's no audit trail. Thank you. Are there any further questions? No, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I know you've put a huge amount of effort into this, and we really have tried to make this work. And I think all the um, all our authorities have um, expressed regret that this is being lost. But you know, with, in an area with such high land values, it's a model that is really struggling to work. Um, and I know East, East Cambridge are very committed to this, you know, to the point where they fund it them, themselves. 
Um, and it's very pleasing that it seems to work in East Cambridgeshire, but we haven't seen it, much evidence of it working, working elsewhere, really. Um, so the recommendation is uh, to recommend to the Combined Authorities Board that the Combined Authority discontinues providing a support service and further grant funding to community homes groups on the 31st of July 2023 and to authorise an extension of the agreement with Eastern Community Homes to provide a support service to community homes groups from the 30th of June 2023 to the 31st of July 2023 on existing terms. Um, do we want to show hands, or are we in unanimously in agreement? Do you want to come in? Yeah. Uh, just to give you a Huntingdonshire perspective on this, so the officer feedback from HDC is actually advocating for a review rather than a withdrawal. And in fact, in Huntingdonshire, we have a real success story. Um, it may be the only one that's visible to us, um, but the the Great Staughton project. And so I would just um, actually feed back in their own words. They've said it takes time to get to the requisite point to make an application. This is why it would be so unfortunate if the funding is to be withdrawn when we and possibly other groups may be nearly ready to make an application. So they've had one site that was successful and then in the group of applications we're going to look at, there's another, well, they're looking at two possible to take one forward. Um, so I think it is possible to have success stories through this scheme, um, but not as it is currently organized. So from the Huntingdonshire perspective, um, I think we would be in favor of a review, but not a withdrawal. Okay. So my sense is that we've, that's what we've done. We've done a review, haven't we, since it last came to this committee, really. I mean, before I bring in Councillor Dupre, would you just like to comment on whether you feel we've already done that? Um, what I can say is that uh, in March, the committee deferred the decision on the basis that we'd undertake a full consultation, which I've done and which is evidenced in the appendices. Um, it was a very thorough uh, exercise. Um, we only had three groups respond. Um, so that's, that, that, you know, can't do more, really. Thank, thank you. Councillor Dupre. Thank you. Um, just to say that the uh, we've heard... Well, firstly, the scheme has been in place for some time, so it's not as if there was only a, a short window to make application. There was plenty of time going back some time, and we've just heard that there were a number of organisations that applied some time ago and never actually proceeded with that for whatever reason. So um, I, think, I think it's had its chance, um, and I... And I'm entirely happy to support the recommendation. However, I would just point out that 3.3 of the report says that the option um, was cons to continue to provide a service was considered and rejected. I think that's a bit premature because surely that's what we're here to decide whether or not to recommend. Uh, it sounds a bit like the decision has already been pre-made, which I don't think, I genuinely don't think is the case, but we all want to see reports written suggesting that they have been. Thank, thank you. Do you just want to comment on 3.3, .3, Nick? Um, when I wrote the report, it's a new template, and... I was taking that as uh, a basis of why the recommendation was uh, my initial recommendation, not the second recommendation, it was to discontinue. I, but that wasn't rejected, that option, the, the, the whole matter was deferred, if we're referring to the, the discussion of several months ago. It was deferred. That that option wasn't rejected by anybody. So would it um, would would it make any difference if we just took out three point three? So I'm asking Caroline. Uh, I'm happy to if you want to take it, it take it uh, it, take it out as a, as a as a as a comment that was intended for the first recommendation and not the second one. Do you think it's causing confusion, Caroline? Any problem with it being 
Yes, it is. If there you, is some confusion. Okay, so if you feel it's causing amb ambiguity, then we'll remove that. Okay. All right. I mean, are you happy for me to take this to a vote now? Okay. So those in favour of the recommendations, uh, please raise your hands. That's three. And those against? Three. Uh, do I have... Um, so what happens then? So where, do, where does that leave us? Oh, okay, right. Okay. Right. Okay. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, so moving, moving on. Sorry, Thank you, Chair. What was the outcome of that? There was a discussion at the top table. To hung, I'm not sure for the vote, record what, the, what has happened. A hung vote to the board. Okay, it goes to the board without a recommendation. Is that what we're saying? Sorry, my understanding is that it, that the chair doesn't. Sorry, the chair doesn't have a casting vote, so it, it the recommendation goes to the board that it was it was hung. It was three votes um, both ways, and up to them to then take that on board. Okay, all okay with that? Yep. All right, fine. Thank you very much indeed. Um, okay, moving on to item seven, um, which is these um, these applications we've had. So back to Nick. Thank you, Nick. Thank you, Chair. In October 2022, £100,000 was made available as grant funding to support established community housing groups across the whole of Cambridgeshire and Peterborough. These grants were in addition to start-up grants of £5,000 to support emerging community homes groups. In March 2023, there had been no take-up of the £5,000 start-up grants that were approved in 2001, and no applications had been received for technical support grants. Four grant applications were then received in May that have been reviewed by officers against the assessment criteria that can be found at Appendix A. The first of which was uh, an application by Great Staunton Community Land Trust, uh, and that seeks funding of £15,000 to undertake basic site surveys, access assessments, and ecology surveys for two sites, and then an overall viability of a preferred site. Great Staunton Community Land Trust is working to respond to a neighbourhood call, plan, uh, call for sites exercise being undertaken by the Parish Council. The surveys will provide an evidence-based approach to identifying and promoting a site and this demonstrates a sound approach to deliver, deliverability. It is clear that the trust is building on the experience and success of the previous scheme, and it is recommended that the application be approved, subject to a requirement that the reports may only be used to promote a site that will incorporate delivery of a community homes development. The next application was from uh, Suvana uh, for a grant of £5,335 uh, to support a community homes proposal in North Cambridge. The application is supported by a draft business plan and an outline land brief, but it fails to include a clear and deliverable plan to undertake pre-development work as required by the deliverability assessment criteria, so it is recommended that the application be declined. The next application was from It Takes a City Community Land Trust and they applied for £57,494 to support delivery of four modular homes for homeless people at Hills Avenue in Cambridge. The freehold of the site is owned by Cambridge City Council and It Takes a City hope to agree terms to acquire a 10-year lease of the site from the council. Now this fails to comply with the with the requirement to protect the benefits of the scheme in perpetuity, as specified with the grant, within the grant assessment criteria. So it is recommended that the application be declined. It takes a city submitted another application for a grant of £29,654 to support delivery of 10 or more modular homes for homeless people on freehold land owned by the Ely Diocese at Fenditton. It takes a city hope to agree terms to acquire a five-year lease of the site from the diocese. 
So again, this fails to comply with the requirement to protect the benefits of the scheme in perpetuity, as specified within the grant assessment criteria. So it is recommended that the application be declined. And that concludes the presentation, thank you. Thank, thank you very much, Nick. Um, can I just clarify something? So um, it says in the first paragraph of 3.1, uh, it refers to provision of 5,000 pound community startup grants, and yet all, all of these are for more than 5,000, some of them considerably more. If you look at the uh, two. Yes, later on, in, later on it's, there are two initiatives uh, here, Chair. Okay. Um, the, the first was a, a £5,000 startup grant, mm -hmm. one that was approved in January 2021. Uh, and, the, and the second was uh, approved in October 2022 when the, the combined authority made a further £100,000 available to community homes groups that were established. Uh, and this, ah. this, was, this was, again, uh, a different criteria was written uh, to assess these applications, and there's an emphasis on the groups being established and having evidence of deliverability. Thank you very much indeed. All right, any questions? Uh, yes, Councillor Goodell. Yes, Nick. Um, I see that the ACRI form, they fought, they, all the uh, applicants fulfilled all their, their criteria. Should not their criteria be closely knitted to your, your own? so that they could be weeded out at that level rather than come all the way through. Yeah, thank, thanks for that. That's a good observation. Um, normally, we I would have expected to uh, review all the applications with our consultant, Eastern Community Homes, um, because I, I don't like coming here and recommending that the, the combined authority declines applications um, but unfortunately, as I say, there, there wasn't any time. Uh, we have to um, program committee meetings and agendas. Uh, and so if they had applied six months ago, we could have, Eastern Community Homes could have done some work and, and, and gotten to a stage whereby we might be able to recommend approval. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Dupre. Thank you. Um, my understanding was that Eastern Community Homes was supposed to be assessing these bids against the, the criteria established by the combined authority, not against their own set of criteria. And if that's the case, my question, and I did have a question on this item, was going to be, if that is the case, then why has Eastern Community Homes said that the criteria have been met in cases where they clearly have not, particularly in the case of uh, applications, uh, the third and fourth applications, around the in perpetuity nature of what we're asking for. We're asking for something that is going to be long lasting, and yet it is clear that their applications are for something that is very short lived indeed and and therefore my un, my my concern is that eastern community homes appears not to have taken that on board and weeded those out at that stage um which is is uh, difficult for uh, officers to handle and uh, and slightly irritating for for members here today to handle i would thank suggest you. do you want to comment on that nick um thank you it's a good observation yes it was a difficult uh decision but uh, we the, the applications were submitted um, and so they they have to be determined uh, I, you, in, in the appendices you can see uh, what Eastern Community Homes have recommended and that co contrasts with my recommendation um, and I was purely applying as Councillor Dupre said the criteria that was approved by the, the committee do come back wasn't so much coming back as, as I had a second question, which was that while the third and fourth applications clearly don't fulfil that criteria about criterion about being something that is is um, permanent and, and therefore in the, the the benefit is felt in perpetuity. Nonetheless, they were about something which is extremely important, which is about providing housing for homeless people. Um, is there any other work stream that 
the combined authority is doing that that could have that application could have been made to instead of this one where it would have fitted and if there isn't uh, a, a piece of work around that is there anything that we should be looking at to see whether such applications which it seems to me have some merit albeit not for this scheme could actually be um, considered and, and addressed Nick um, the the housing program um, ended in March 2022 um, and there isn't it would have to be a decision I think by the combined authorities board on where they wanted to employ those resources um, so I, until that discussion has, has been had then I'm not aware of any um, initiatives to support homeless people thank you uh, councillor Todd Jones Thank you, Chair. Yeah, um, I would also found the um, uh, Appendix B a bit confusing, given that the, uh, the four applications appeared to be meeting all the criteria, and whether that was meeting the criteria against those community groups or the actual applications themselves, um, I just found it a bit confusing in the way it's laid out in, the, in Appendix B. Um, also, I would, if that you kind of sort of answered that, um, but they all appear to be signed off approving the grant requested for each um, each, each group that came forward by um, Jenna Brain. But anyway, um, the, the three that were rejected, um, I'm a, I've had a little bit to do with It Takes a City in my role on the City Council. Um, and knowing the organize, organization a bit, um, which I think they're, they're pretty well organized, I was just really surprised that they were not aware of, even though you don't have the didn't have the time to go back to them and work with the, their proposal. Um, I'm just really surprised that they were not aware of the uh, in perpetuity criteria, which is obviously a fundamental criteria for the combined authority. Um, and I'm just really surprised that, that they come forward with something which was clearly going to fail in terms of that criteria. Um, but did you have any kind of um, liaison or feedback to it take the city about their bids at all? Um, I haven't had, had the um, time to have uh, detailed discussions with each applicant. These were submitted um, from claims from Eastern Community Homes that they've been working and supporting these groups. Uh, and yet the um, applications that were submitted clearly don't uh, meet the criteria. So one can only conclude from that that perhaps Eastern Community Homes haven't done their job properly on this occasion with these applications. Thank you very much. Uh, Councillor uh, Ray da Davenport Ray. I agree. I'm happy to support all the recommendations you've put in, in this report. Um, at my question on behalf of the Great Staunton Group would then be if um, the board is later minded to withdraw the scheme um, and they have had this um, approval at an early stage of their plan, um, what resources might be available for them when they move to the next stage and they have found the site if the scheme is withdrawn? And um, I think I, I agree with all the comments uh, I've heard so far. I think that this committee has had the ability to see the two agenda items together and they really influence each, each other. So as we're going to send a um, non-decision to the board to consider, I'd really like an addition to their board report about this item as well, because I think that seeing the results of the scheme will be important for them to see and, you know, that decision on whether to withdraw the scheme or not. So, so the board, the board gets, um, gets notified about any decisions made by, by all the committees, so that will happen anyway, okay. Right, Righty-ho, um, I mean, and we know we need to be very mindful that we're spending public money here and you know we've got we really have to demonstrate value, value for money, and that uh, we're actually delivering on delivering on our priorities. Um, so, uh, does anybody want to vote against or abstain on any of the recommendations, or can we take these by agreement? So, by by agreement, then. Thank you very much indeed. Thank thank you, Nick, for all your work on that, which I know has been done in a high pressure, time constrained situation. Okay, so moving on to item eight, 
uh, which is sustainable land use advice. I'm just trying to find it. Okay, and uh, Adrian, over to you on this one. Thank you, Chair. Um, uh, a number of items that I'm going to pick up. The first one, the sustainable land use uh, uh, report. So the board made an allocation in the medium-term financial budget to undertake um, some support for, uh, at the time, a rewilding program, which was about um, bringing nature back uh, to land it's otherwise um, uh, not currently used for that purpose. Um, we went out to consult the sector to see how we could set up the most appropriate way to provide that revenue support. Um, and the report summarizes the uh, uh, conclusions that came back which were two, really, which there was very much support out there amongst uh, farm businesses, land managers, and other agencies for uh, introducing more elements of nature into the way they ran their businesses or managed their land. Um, and particularly uh, in the context of continuing their current operations and making them more sustainable, not necessarily um, a complete change of land use uh, uh, to, to nature. The second one was to have a, uh, a trusted source of advice. So, that, you know, it's very much um, these are um, pe people who have responsibilities in terms of either business objectives or nature objectives. And therefore, if there was going to be advice provided, they did want to have a respected source um, that, that knew about their their interests uh, as part of it. Um, whilst we're doing this, uh, the new responsibilities, which is the next item on our, on our agenda, uh, have emerged from government, which is to <clears throat> introduce a local nature recovery strategy across the area. And whilst the focus of that, as we'll come on to, is very much about identifying priorities for nature improvement, uh, there is also the important aspect of delivery. Um, and so we want to make sure that as we're developing a local nature recovery strategy, we're working with people who manage the land in terms of discussing how it might be delivered. And so the proposal that we've got in front of you on the land use advice service is to essentially merge the, the two principles together and that that revenue money can support engagement with farm businesses and landowners um, on the local nature recovery strategy, particularly focusing in on the delivery aspects. Um, so what we've proposed here is to seek a steer from this committee that, that, that it's an appropriate way forward. We would work with the team on the local nature recovery strategy to come back with the specific po proposals at the next meeting. Thank you very much indeed, Adrian. That's, uh, that's all very interesting. So this is um, 150,000 spread over two years, and then I presume its continuation will then come back for an approval of further funding thereafter? Yes, it's a, it's, it's a two-year allocation in the medium-term financial budget. Anything further would have to be decided um, through the budget yeah. setting process. Okay, thank you. Any questions from members? Uh, Councillor Davenport Ray. Thank you, Adrian. Um, the term used in the report is land managers. Can you tell us more about who is included in that definition? What is a land manager and what is included? Uh, so um, I think it's it, it's a bit a bit of shorthand to make sure that we don't miss anyone who has uh, an interest in how our land looks. So um, if we talk about farm businesses, then we need to make sure that we're talking about both tenants and landowners, but also uh, across Cambridgeshire and Peterborough, there are a number of other um, both uh, environmental bodies um, and councils who own land. And so it's a term just to encompass anyone who might have a, uh, a an interest in controlling how how nature might be managed. Okay. Uh, Councillor Good Goodell. Yes, going back to the previous agenda, um, how are we going to advertise this and to ensure that people apply for the grant? So we need to work up the exact business case of how we would deploy the service. Um, we do have um, 
a number of key groups that we talk to regularly in terms of engagement. Um, so uh, as well as the uh, Local Nature Partnership, which itself has connections through to um, farm businesses and landowners, we also, as a combined authority, fund Fendland Soil, which is um, working directly with farmers in, in that part of our patch. But we, uh, we will use our, our contacts um, to, to, to make sure that what service we design is accessible to people to get that advice. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Uh, Councillor Dupre? Just a quick question about the extent to which, if at all, this work, which I think is absolutely excellent, I'm very pleased to see this because there's a lot of energy uh, in, in Cambridgeshire behind all of this at the moment and it's really good to be uh, moving that forward. To what extent, if at all, this is connected with the work being done on the land use framework? That's the um, uh, FFCC work. Yes, so um, just, just for context, there is a piece of work by the um, uh, Farm and Conservation, um, uh, uh, um, I'm trying to think of the acronym now. But, uh, thank you. Food, Farming and Countryside Commission uh, looking at uh, work on a land use framework in the context of land use being the, the full land use, how we manage all parts rather than we're in the planning context. Um, and we are... Uh, in contact with the steering group um, and, and partaking in the thinking on that um, across. So it's another avenue. There is actually, uh, as you highlighted, a huge amount of activity going on. There is also a very major research project the University of Cambridge is leading on. Um, so we're, we're trying to sort of bring all those things together in, in bringing this advice forward. Thank you. And what sort of time frame are we looking to for this to get the business case Ready. So we would bring it back to the um, next meeting of this committee, okay. which oh, okay. um, when we come on to later may yep. well be later in the year rather than next month. <laughs> <laughs> right. Jolly, jolly good. Okay. Well, I'm happy to uh, propose this. I'd like to second uh, Councillor Dupre. Is everybody supportive of this? Yep. Okay. Unanimously. Thank you very much indeed. And uh, yeah, what's my, my computer gone funny? Righty ho, moving on to item nine, uh, which is the local nature recovery strategy, which is a big bit of work, and is Adrian again. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so uh, the report you've got in front of you sets out uh, a forthcoming responsibility. Um, as, I've, as I've mentioned already, the government has set in place um, a countrywide network of local nature recovery strategies to be produced. Um, it's a statutory process, um, and there are therefore regulations and guidance um, attached to it, but also as a new burdens, um, it comes with um, funding to complete uh, the, the work. So this report sets out uh, the, the scale of that funding um, and the program approach that we're taking. But first thing I have to say is that we are still waiting for the letter from the minister to formally confirm um, the duty uh, has been enacted uh, to the combined authority. Um, that's a national picture. It, it, everyone's waiting for the, oh, okay. the, the confirmation. Um, the, the funding of 309,000 um, over two years was developed by DEFRA, taking into account um, both the number of uh, a core amount plus a consideration of the number of farm businesses in the area and the number of supporting authorities. And you'll see in the report, um, there will be a responsible authority, which would be the combined authority, and every other council has a specific statutory role as a supporting authority. Um, and at different stages as we bring the plan forward, supporting authorities have um, the the formal input to the process to say that they're happy with the engagement and they're happy with the plan and if not then we have to resolve that or ultimately report to the minister that we have a difference of opinion um, there are five recommendations here so the first is um, essentially to acknowledge the the new burdens funding when that is finally confirmed um, to move it straight into an approved budget line so that we can 
um, immediately continue the work that we are, have already prepared for um, on the local nature recovery strategy, um, which meets the third recommendation, which is the outline program, which is to achieve uh, a local nature recovery strategy within uh, um, an 18 month period. Um, fourthly, to delegate to the chief, uh, to the exec director of place and connectivity to agree the operational arrangements. Um, and as you'll see from the report, um, we have been working with uh, Cambridgeshire County Council to deliver the operational side of the, the preparation and continue on the local nature recovery strategy. Um, and we're, um, we're joined online with Quinton Carroll from the County Council who has been leading that piece of work. Um, and I'm delighted to say that um, in terms of the response from Natural England to where we are, we've been um, very uh, well received how prepared we are as an area for taking this forward. And it does build on the legacy of work that the combined authority has been supporting on the environment um, since its inception. And finally, under E, to note the arrangement for the involvement of all councils. Um, so we have uh, a, a number of structures proposed. A message coming back very clearly from constituent councils was to not um, create a load more committee, uh, uh, a load more officer groupings if they already exist. So. Where we are, where we can, we will use. We have an existing ecologist uh, working group and an existing planners group um, to pick that up. Uh, so it's a really exciting program. It is challenging, um, obviously, uh, to do all this within 18 months with the full engagement. Um, the other aspect to note is from this November, biodiversity net gain um, is a mandatory requirement to be introduced. Yeah. And the aim of the local nature recovery strategy is to help influence where the priority places are. And so what we intend to do is to do an element of an interim position statement by November to help planning authorities um, with that process. Obviously, it won't carry the full weight of the strategy. And we have been waiting um, some months for the government to finalise all the arrangements on this, hence not able to meet that November deadline. Thank, thank you very much, and much indeed. Um, I wonder if Quinton would just like to come in at this point just to sort of reassure us about, um, you know, the capacity at the County Council to deliver, uh, you know, quite a large programme in quite a challenging period of time. <clears throat> Thanks, Chair. Can you check if you can hear me properly? Sorry, the sound, the sound's not good. Could you... Could you repeat that again? Could you repeat that, Quinton? Uh, I, I, was, I was just asking if you can hear me, OK? Yes, we can now. We can now. We right. couldn't have Thank you. Uh, yes, capacity. Yeah, we, we've we've brought across a, um, an officer specifically to lead our work on this. It's Gabriella Yeomans, who is known to a few of you. She used to do the same role on our, on our Future Parks Accelerator. There's a lot of uh, the programme that we were working on it does draw a lot on external resources because you're right, it's a big ask. Uh, but we're pretty confident that with our, with our own resources, that of the supporting authorities, the support of Natural England, um, and the support of any services or, or external service or consultancy requirements, we can deliver this within the timescales. As Adrian said, um, we are significantly further advanced than many other areas. Uh, so, I mean... Uh, because the two-year clock starts when the when we receive notification from the Secretary of State. Some places haven't even got approval to even do the work yet or done any, any recruitment. Whereas whereas we have and we've already done the groundwork with all our with the supporting authorities and um other stakeholders like the like RSPB, LMP, Wildlife Trust, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. Excellent. Oh, that's very reassuring. Thank you very much indeed, Quinton. Uh, questions from members. Councillor Davenport Ray. I have a few questions, Adrian. Would you like one at a time or all together? Do one at, do one one at, at a time. time. And, uh, and Quinton can come in as well. Quinton as well. If you yeah, well, first of all, I'm, I'm very ex excited by this work. I, I think um, it's so important for our region, but it's also going to be very difficult. And I think we can't underestimate um, how difficult it will be, especially around our peatland areas, which I think there's a lot of potential for nature recovery, um, but there's still a lot more work to do. 
the I appreciate especially the November interim report because I think that transition into biodiversity net gain and how landowners think about the nature on their land, not just in their own space, but how they might be able to trade that will be really important. In section 3.10 of your report, you talk about the uh, responsible authorities need to involve people and groups from across the public, the private, and voluntary sectors. Uh, so my first question is in your development group and in the structure you've set out in the appendix, where do the public and voluntary groups come in to that work? And then I'll, I'll leave my other questions for later. So it, in the steering group, um, we've got the Local Nature Partnership, um, which is uh, the charitable organization to uh, advance nature in, in our area. And within their structure, there is um, a whole range of groups that feed in to, to them. So that's one way through. One of the pieces of work um, that we're doing is the engagement strategy. So throughout the whole process, we'll be looking at how we do engage um, both the public and also particular interest groups um, as part of that. Um, so there will be consultation at specific stages of it, um, which will allow um, anyone to have an input. But we are looking at how we do sort of build that engagement um, better from the beginning. Next question. My other two questions are about the timeline that you've set out, which is really helpful. Um, for me to understand the scale of this project. We have several items that are due to be completed by May and June, and I'm wondering um, what the, if those are on target. And then also at the very end of the project plan, we have November 2024 when we would give notice to the Secretary of State. I'm wondering, because this is such a new process, do we think it will be similar to a local plan where it's not simply giving notice, but being reviewed in some way um, by government when we submit a plan. Do you want to take that one? Yes, so uh, in terms of the, the dates that are May and June, so that reflects the fact that we had already started effectively sort of shadow work in preparation uh, to this with some additional capacity money that was provided by government. Um, and so uh, we are on target with those, but um, as one of those was developing the engagement plan, and obviously we're, we've talked about that, we haven't brought that to this meeting, but it is um, in progress with the, the, the team. Um, and uh, it, it just reflects the fact that we wanted to make sure we were on a good start uh, on this process, and we'll, we'll continually update the committee as to where we are with those. Um, in terms of the uh, final submission, so there is a... Uh, as I say, it's a statutory process, so there are regulations about um, how that is provided. Um, part of the um, element of getting to that is when we have the consultation, um, the results of the consultation are reported to government, and, and that would pick up particularly where there are um, issues where we're not got full support of our supporting authorities, which obviously government would be very keen to explore with us. Um, but in terms of the, um, the final bit of the process, government wants to have a UK-wide suite of documents, and I think there will be looking at consistency. So I'll need to check exactly what happens at the final bit where we say published, unless um, Ms. Quinton can come in and confirm whether there's additional timing after that, I suspect, from the government side. Quinton, do you want to add anything to that? Um, no, just to comment on the... I just picked up the fact that stakeholder engagement is the key thing. And we've already started. We had a big, uh, we, we, had, we had a workshop in the middle of May with a lot of uh, the agencies and organisations to try and get people's understandings of what they wanted from this process. Community and, and pick engagement with people is very important. And as you see, there's an action here to go out. And the first thing is to um, develop that engagement plan with Natural Cambridgeshire. They already, they already have those connections uh, on the ground and all those networks that we don't, those farm, those farm, farm uh, cluster, farming clusters, for example, that we don't. So that's a, that's a key thing. The um, in terms of the Secretary of State's review, Adrian's right. There are several stages we have to go through and report in at the time. 
and we have to have the backing from Natural England. Well, we've been we've been allocated the senior advisor by Natural England, um, who's been working with us for a, a year now on this, um, and she's heavily involved in our governance. And it, it, in essence, the, the homework should be checked before we submit it. Is is, is the best way of saying it. The and the whole point of the consult, consultation with the sporting authorities is to make sure that any issues, challenges, contradictions will have been ironed out or every effort has been made to iron them out. Now, the tech, we, what we don't know yet is how long the Secretary of State will take to review them, but uh, he or she will have 44 of them um, so, to, to do. So that's going to be an, an, an interesting challenge. But what we're being told by Natural England is not to wait for that approval. Once it's been, once the supporting authorities are happy, we can start using it as a live document. Okay, and I imagine, and it sounds as if our submission might well be in advance of other people's. Yes, um, we have we, we have two years. We, we're aiming for eighteen months. The because um, that gives us a six month slippage or problem solving or enhancement. Uh, I mean, the LNRS regs and guidance set out the minimum, but. As the as point was the main area, this is critically important for Cambridgeshire. We're the most nature depleted uh, air place in the country. Uh, so um, we can do more than the minimum, in my view. Thank, thank you, Quinton. Councillor Dupre? Thank you. Firstly, I just wanted to uh, remind members for the record of my, my interest as Chair of the Environment and Green Investment Committee of the County Council, which, uh, as we know, is the, the delivery um, body for this Thank and um, I don't think th that there is a conflict in that the decision that the County Council would be involved in in delivering this was has already been made and nothing today is changing that and also that the the only recommendation about that to agree today is a, a delegation so uh, unless I'm advised otherwise I don't believe it would be inappropriate of me to be involved in this I can't see an interest here uh, okay. Yeah, we have Caroline. Okay. But um, on on that basis, just to okay. Um, yeah. uh, Caroline's going to have a think of, think about oh, it. Right. Okay. okay. Uh, I I just had a question on the timeline, um, which was uh, something that none of us can control, um, which is that the consultation phase recommended in here is March to June. Uh, 2024, <laughs> and I can imagine that that might be prime time for a, a general election. Um, and I'm assuming mm. that officers will have been considering all of the risks, including the political risks associated with with this. Not only might that knock out the consultation phase if uh, if we're not able to do it during that period, but also it could knock out all the phases there afterwards if there's a new Secretary of State and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And I just wondered whether there were... Uh, any words from the officers about the consideration they had given to the political risk at this time frame? I mean, I assume the six-month buffer allows for that, but... Um... Yes, I mean, it, it, it's always difficult to sort of um, preempt all of these uh, things that might come along. Um, as I said, we, we have tried to get a march on through the preliminary work that we've done, so we might be able to sort of uh, avoid that through when we might undertake it but yes we have some scope in the program and I guess whilst it wouldn't be good for getting an approved strategy as Quinton says if we've done all the work and they may or may not be new politicians thinking about um, how they might want to uh, deal with the national picture we could still carry on using it and encouraging delivery so I think a lot of it, it you know, it, it won't be wasted. Um, and if if we have to move that consultation later, then we've got scope and, and everyone will be affected by the, the same issue, of course. Thank you very much. Any other questions? Uh, yes, Councillor Good. Uh, just uh, one question. Um, can the, the strategy be worked in with other plans hand in glove i'm thinking more like the climate action plan where we have to store water you know more water because of global warning and water is going to become a, 
a, a greatly wanted commodity. When we build these reservoirs, can we make them naturally beautiful as well, rather than like the sterile ones we got along when you go on the train between Ely and Cambridge, and they're just there, and all you get is the odd bit of fowl on there. We can make it a nature park, so encourage public to use it as well as storing the water for everything else. If only we were in control of that. <laughs> so um, one of the things that the strategy that we will be doing is looking at wider benefits. So um, whilst there might be specific sites that might be important for habitats or for different species, what we're actually looking at exactly as you said, looking for those other opportunities because we recognise particularly to get significant delivery, we need to work with what else is going on. And the good example that you gave around reservoirs, there is a lot of conversation mm -hmm. in terms of with Anglian Water with their new proposal for the for the very large reservoir for public water supply about looking at all those wider benefits that can be delivered at the same time. And we've seen that elsewhere in the country, some really good examples. So yes, we're definitely looking at that as part of the process. And I think it's relevant with all major infrastructure, including East West Rail, um, which is only going for 10% get net gain when actually, you know, they have potential to do more. So um, yeah, ongoing conversation. Okay, so I'm happy to propose this. Uh, do I have a seconder, please? Uh, I'll take Councillor Goodall. Uh, thank you very much. Um, are we happy to approve all five recommendations? Okay. Subject to the open cut being below 200,000. 200, okay, I'll so make that. The director has, the has delegated that. To be able to do that very much. Okay, thank you very much. I'll make that clear. So, so a recommendation four actually doesn't need to be voted on because the executive director have, has delegated authority for spend under 200,000. So if you just note that, and we are approving A, B, C, and E. Okay, agreed. Thank you. And moving on to um, Climate Action Plan, which has already been referenced today. Another massive, massive piece of work. Adrian, I suppose this is you again. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, so uh, apologies for the amount of, of, of paperwork um, I've put in front of you today. It's, it's um, much better than it's been in the past. So, <laughs> you know, <laughs> big improvement. So, uh, the Commodity Authority has taken a very uh, proactive role in uh, addressing the climate crisis um, since um, its inception, um, even though the devolution deal was pretty, I would say light, but didn't really mention climate at the time, reflecting, I guess, discussions back in 2016. Um, so following the recommendations of the Independent Commission on Climate, a climate action plan uh, was developed uh, uh, through a climate partnership which is uh, supported by the Commodity Authority, led by the Mayor, but is a multi-partner um, partnership bringing together interests across business, across um, the public sector and the voluntary sector. Um, the report you've got in front of you was to bring you up to date with progress on the Climate Action Plan, so it's a, uh, a, a plan to 2025. Um, it very much focuses on collaborative action that can be taken, um, supported uh, at the county scale um, in particular, because we acknowledge that every local authority uh, is doing its own work in terms of dealing with the challenges of, of, of climate, both in terms of emissions, but also particularly for our area, adaptation to climate impacts that, that are happening and will happen. So um, we've had the reference to water supply um, and we're going to get um, uh, hotter, hotter summers going forward, mm -hmm. warmer, wetter winters, but hotter summers. Um, and so drought is going to be a, a, a real challenge um, on us. Uh, so in this report, I've set out the progress on the Climate Action Plan. I've also set out progress on the um, allocations that the board made for some specific projects um, to take forward um, ourselves. Um, to note that uh, we are, one of those projects is around uh, working with care homes to address the 
impacts of climate change through a grant program, uh, which we match funded with their investment, uh, which is a really exciting project in terms of dealing with that issue of both very vulnerable residents um, to things like overheating and the fact that the care sector uh, has obviously had to cope with the pandemic and all of the challenges following that. So this is a program um, that we've got under where we've gone out to care homes and just in here is for you to approve the arrangements that uh, we'll have an officer group that will approve applications under that uh, process. And, and finally, uh, coming up in the autumn is the proposal to have a, a um, climate engagement event, which basically um, climate summit, let's keep yeah. it, uh, which would focus in on both mm -hmm. what's been achieved uh, in the Cambridgeshire context, but also looking forward to the other activity that we can deliver um, because we know that there needs to be a, a huge amount of, of activity both on mitigation and adaptation. So there's three recommendations there in front of you. Thank you very much indeed. And I hope with the summit that we include young people, we find a way of really in including young people in that. Um, so um, we've been talking to uh, uh, some of the work that's already been done, some of the schools mm -hmm. that have, have led on some of this. So we are developing that part of the engagement um, so that we will have um, uh, a focus on what's, what young people feel about um, climate change and, and um, obviously some challenge back to us as to yeah. what we're doing about it. Yeah, actually, the, the young voices that are the strongest, actually. It's their future. Okay, any questions? Councillor Dupre. Thank you. Um, I was wondering, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Yes, it is now. Um, I was wondering whether somebody could talk me through who monitors and manages the risks associated with the Climate Action Plan the, and the various responsibilities of officers, um, the Climate Partnership, this committee, the board, and possibly audit and governance as well? Um, because what we have in this report is a... a, a, a fairly straightforward, um, but not very in, um, informative rag rating of green, amber, or red. And we have key risks, which can often just be one risk named as this is what the risk is without saying anything about it and what's being done to mitigate it. Um, and I suspect there may even be some question about whether those are the key risks. I mean, for example, in WS5, I rather doubt that changes to government transport policy and resourcing to deliver the plan is actually the key risk associated with the local transport and connectivity plan at the moment. Um, so who, who is in charge of that and how do we see how, the, how those risks are being managed and monitored. There's nothing, for example, about the Climate Partnership um, online that I could find, so it doesn't seem to be public. It doesn't seem to appear in the list of meetings, so it presumably doesn't meet in public. Its decisions don't seem to be made public. It, are they, do they go directly to the board? Do they come here? Just a sense of the governance, particularly around the risks in all of this, which is a, a very huge programme, and a lot of it is struggling with, with finance and resources, from what I can see in the key risk column. I'll do my best on governance and risk. Uh, so uh, you're correct that uh, to date, the key route has been to report to board um, in terms of the climate action um, uh, area. Obviously, now this is a key responsibility of this committee, and so we'll be bringing reports through to this committee as we've done here. Um, we uh, There are a number of different types of risk, as you, as you, you, you will be aware. So we do have... Um, a corporate risk register which does have um, a climate risk on it um, in terms of, of, of to the organization. Um, we have the report you've got in front of you which is um, the RAG rating is really a sort of progress report on the climate action plan rather than as you correctly say um, a, a risk analysis. Um, and then uh, what, what we will be doing this year is developing a very specific climate risk register. Um, so we can bring that back um, to the committee here, but we'll need to 
obviously dovetail into the existing arrangements in terms of how that feeds in both to the corporate plan um, and elsewhere. What we did with the initial climate commission was that we actually also had a research study into climate risks to the area, which are obviously different from risks of performance. There are, there are actual climate risks in terms of flooding and, and heat. And so, um, again, we're, we're currently considering whether that needs to be updated. Um, and obviously, that that's an opportunity to, to bring that. Um, the climate partnership, it is... Uh, it's an advisory it's group. It's an advisory it's group. Decision yes, group. yeah. So it's a advisory group that feeds mm -hmm. in. Um, so it doesn't have a web presence particularly, um, but you know, it, it, it does then feed into the work that we've taken direct to board, and that gets the public airing of, of what, what's coming out of that. Were well, their papers not public, though? For the last meeting, there was really nice reports, I remember, from all the partner authorities on the progress they'd made. I don't think, I think those papers were publicly available. So it's not, uh, so, we, so we have published the information that we mm. received in terms of all the progress of authorities, which, mm. which was a core part of those papers. But currently it's not, as you correctly say, it's not on our website as a one of our advisory group set of papers. Could I just come back for clarity then? So the, the, the process to date is that the, the Advisory Climate Partnership has reported directly to board on, on matters including risk and that you're suggesting that we will get now some risk reports coming to this committee because there's, there's a lot of work in here and I do wonder, bearing in mind the, the volume of work that the board gets, whether the board alone will be able to do the kind of in-depth um, review of this that I would have thought members would have wanted to be doing about the risks associated with this piece of work. So, so we're, we are obviously in a new structure now um, and the terms of reference of this committee are to deal with the, um, the, the climate action plan. So therefore this would be the route that I would be reporting um, those issues to. Um, there is a wider process of improvement which includes changes to our risk reporting and so I will obviously need to go away and, and confer with colleagues who are leading on that process as to exactly how things are reported um, but, but certainly <coughs> we would be bringing the information here rather than into the board. You're okay with that are you now? Okay right take care. Any other? Uh, yes Councillor Davenport Ray. Thank you for the report. I think it shows a lot of the work that the Combined Authority has been doing so far, um, but I do still have a few concerns. In Section 2.2, you're describing the event that you're planning for November, and um, similar to Councillor Smith, I think you use the word stakeholders will be involved. Um, I think that one word is probably is so important. Who are those stakeholders? And she's mentioned young people, um, but I think we need to be able to think beyond just um, natural Cambridgeshire or someone we would usually go to to try to get opinion from landowners and, and from environmental groups and so that um, invite list to that event will be uh, very important. Uh, also you may have some competition with Hunting Dentures Climate Summit which will also be happening in November. I think in the action plan status reports um, WS2 engagement, Arian engagement I think this is the area that gives me um, the most concern. If we look at the first item by June 2022 to develop an engagement plan, um, and that, that has been done, although it, it didn't meet its deadline, but I feel that I haven't seen it be implemented, um, although we do have an engagement plan that I know local um, charitable groups were helped to develop via that climate partnership. So I'd really like to see that in action, but I'm not sure I agree that it is an amber at this point. And then the, um, the next one, July 2022, the small scale community projects launch plan for early 2023. Again, I think our deadline was July 2022, almost a year ago. So I don't think I would conclude that that one would be a green. So I, I think there's a lot of progress in a lot of the areas here, but it's the engagement 
that is the the most er biggest area of concern for me. I think that there are a lot of opportunities available through that climate partnership to do even more in this area. And uh, so I have a few questions about the climate partnership. It was originally called the Climate Working Group, and I think that's the name that the um, independent commissioners uh, recommended. Mm -hmm. So I'm just interested in where the name change has come from. And then um, I think it would be quite helpful, as this committee now exists, to have a standing item on our agenda, which is what is coming out of that climate partnership? What are, what are their voices and are we listening to them? Because to me, that climate partnership is about not us publishing and telling, but also listening. And I think that was the main conclusion of this um, engagement plan that was devised by that group. Um, I, I will uh, say I am a member of that group <laughs> as well. Um, so maybe I do have an interest, but I think it's important that we make space in this committee to listen to what's coming out of those groups. Thank you. Do you want to pick up on those points? Uh, yes, so um, in terms of uh, stakeholder, so, so the Climate Summit, uh, I think one thing we do recognize is there will be a lot of activity in November because it leads up to the um, COP28. And um, we have a uh, communications group with all of constituent councils um, so that we are mapping and trying to fit something that would be added value into into that what, what's going on um, and so uh, it's very much focused on the range of interests that are on the climate partnership group which hopefully does pick up business um, and and um, public groups as part of that uh, but but we'll certainly be, be sort of developing that and, and very much happy to, to receive input on that on the um, the Community projects, yeah, that that is a that is a um, funding source that we weren't able to bring forward last year, and quite right. And so that's something that we are looking now that we've got a slightly bit more staff capacity in the Command Authority, um, looking at that to bring that forward this year. Um, again, because it very much overlaps with a number of schemes that authorities themselves might be doing, we've got to um, engage to make sure that we're getting our grant scheme aligned with what's happening locally. So that, that's one of the challenges of, of making that work. Um, and then the um, Climate Working Group, it, the name was actually set by the board, um, uh, who uh, I think because, I can't remember what the original suggestion was, but the board wanted something I can't else. Uh, but um, the Climate Working Group felt that partnership was a better term and we took that to board as part of the update um, to get that changed so it's, it's referenced that working together element to it and the on the small grants the decision making for that happens uh, where that would now be this committee that's because that's it's, well. it's in the check. medium term financial plan okay um, and therefore it would come to this committee to yeah. approve the business case good okay Happy with that. Any other questions on this? Uh, that's in Devonport Road. Could we consider a standing item on our agenda for that group to feed in? And by yeah. that, I mean um, not necessarily an, an officer summarizing their thoughts, but perhaps a nominated member from the there's group. Two, there's two of us here who are on it. So, yeah. yeah. And, and of course, the mayor chairs it as well. Of course, so, yeah. And the mayor's Fantastic. Um, part of this, this committee as well. So, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. We're okay with that? Right? Yeah. Okay. Jolly good. Um, so again, I'm happy to um, propose this with a seconder. Uh, Councillor Hussein, thank you very much. Um, and so the recommendations, just going back to them, uh, to note the progress on the action plan, B, to support the proposal for a climate engagement event in the autumn, and C, approve the arrangements for an officer group to approve applications under the Climate Change Care Homes Programme, which nobody's mentioned. Are we all, all okay with that? Okay, that's jolly good. Uh, I can assume that... Everyone's in agreement? Yep, we'll agree unanimously, thank you. And moving on to item 11, which is the strategic infrastructure delivery framework, which is something that always makes people nervous when they hear things like that. But my understanding is that it's for us, the requirement of a strategic 
plan was part of the, de the original Devo deal, but it's up to us to determine you know, what, it's, what its remit is. So um, is that you again, Adrian? Yes, um, this committee has uh, quite a wide range of things to, uh, to, mm. to take on board this, this year, um, which is really exciting uh, for us uh, uh, to bring forward. So um, yeah, as you said, um, the original Devo deal set a requirement to bring forward a spatial framework, not to be a statutory document that replaced local plans, but, but to support that. Um, we, we did some initial work on that and then for various reasons, including government proposing its own spatial plan for the area, um, for, for the Ox, for to Cambridgeshire uh, arc. Um, we haven't taken forward anything additional, um, but we've been rolling forward the budget in anticipation. Um, what we've proposed here is the, the message we've, we've got from constituent authorities is there are very significant barriers to sustainable growth um, in the area. Uh, we've heard about water, um, energy is another one where um, not just the lack of grid capacity and that was highlighted in the work that Greater Cambridge uh, Partnership did in terms of working to bring forward some new substation proposals with our local distribution network, but also the quality of the energy supply. And we've had anecdotal comments from businesses elsewhere uh, across our area of, of not being able to get a consistent supply for what they need. So um, the proposal is to essentially bring forward a piece of work that improves that evidence base um, around those, those key issues, um, obviously uh, explored at a local level for local plans, but authorities are at different places with their local plans. Um, and it's basically uh, to say to seek agreement to essentially approve a piece of work using the um, statutory framework budget to take that forward. It, it won't be, as you say, um, uh, a statutory framework that would conflict with local plans. It's basically saying we've got growth that people are unable to achieve in the area. How can we um, block some of that? So, so for um, people who don't know, in relation to the, what's now called the Oxford Cambridge Partnership, it was called the ARC when it was very much top down from government and involved a non-statutory spatial framework, which every single leader uh, involved threw their hands up in horror and uh, ran, ran away from. Uh, the Oxford Cambridge Partnership now is very bo bottom up and with two work streams, one of which is environment, which I lead, lead on, and the other is economy. Um, so there's a similar piece of work on energy and water um, going on within the Oxford Cambridge Partnership. So, you know, this will fit in, fit in with that. Um, so essentially, we're looking at a framework that deals with energy, water, public and commercial needs, water environmental quality, and managing flood risk, green and blue capital, and connectivity. So it, these are all the things that yeah, I'm sure we're all doing individually within our council. But you know, none of us can so solve the water issue alone. It takes you know, it can only these problems can only be solved on a re on a much probably larger than regional scale. Um, and I think this might help us get the ear of government as far as uh, certainly uh, new reservoirs and so on are concerned, and hopefully help us battle through the blockages we get with energy provision. Um, so, any debate on this? Councillor Dupre. Right. Um, yeah, uh, it follows on from that, that comment that you made about we are all doing this. I mean, it's not just all the authorities that are doing this. It is everybody in the world that is doing this. Every organisation I know of has got a project in the Fens. Uh, most organisations have got projects around water. Uh, we spent... Uh, I think the best part of a day uh, a year or two ago just trying to pull together all the things that everybody was doing about water and it was just massive and there's an issue for me about a how we how we keep on top of that and understand who's doing what among all that multiplicity of of 
plans and projects, um, and also how we, the, the, the document here says that the, the aim of this is to enhance the evidence base on physical infrastructure. It's how we do that without duplicating other people um, and adding to the complexity of all of this. And I was just wondering whether I, I could be told about how we're going to manage both those things, keeping on top of it and, and not adding to the, the jumble, which it could become. So, so it's a requirement of the devolution deal that we, we do a spatial, spatial framework. Um, none of us want it to be done on roads and railways and new towns, I imagine. So you know, this, is, this, is what we, this is what we need. Um, I think you know, the, the advantage of a combined authority is that we are, we are just that. You know, we, we are a partnership of all the councils, so hopefully this will be managed in such a way that we, we're all inputting, and then what there is added, added value from, from us. But I'm going to leave it to Adrian to explain how we deliver on that. Uh, so you're quite correct. There's, there's a huge amount of both existing evidence and activity going on there, but um, we don't have an overall picture of that at all. It's re as you say, you've, you know, just looking at that water issue, um, the, the multitude of different planning processes going on. So this is very much bringing together that, and it's, it's, it's capacity to bring that together. So there, whilst there might be some additional evidence gathering or, 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 or thing, it's actually putting the command authority in a position where it can understand where the key uh, pinch points are and where it can um, bring its voice to bear on that um, and bring things together. So it's very much trying to knit that together. So the, the funding essentially would be to buy capacity to do that. So at the moment, there isn't capacity in the command authority staffing structure to bring that together. Um, so it would be looking to do that. Um, the, so that's, that's keeping on top will be a chat. <laughs> uh, so, um, I think we want to be, this will put us in a position where we know where we are now. And I think the strength of what we do through that will help debate in a number of ways, including any potential additional discussions with government around funding. Uh, I think that will have to prove itself. If that process proves itself, then that would be a budget bid back into the command authority to say, do you want to allocate further budget to this area. Yeah, Councillor Davenport Ray. I think this document sort of succinctly summarizes the conundrum of our generation, which is, you know, we have needs of the residents of all of our districts, but we know what our ecological ceiling is at the same time, and we're going to have to find a balance in between. And so I'm really happy in section 3.8 of the report um, to see talk of infrastructure, including the low carbon transition. Because I think um, you know the combined authority is responsible for a lot of different transport building projects across the district, across all of Cambridgeshire and Peterborough. But we can build physical in infrastructure with lower embedded carbon. Uh, you know th that's a positive endeavor. But I think we also have to try to reduce demand on infrastructure, and we could be well intentioned, well intentioned infrastructure created only to have that increased demand. I mean, I think we have some evidence about you build wider roads, you build more lanes, you increase the demand for roads rather than increase the demand for buses. So this document, I'm, I'm really happy to see. I think it's addressing that issue head on is we need to think about infrastructure and the ecological ceiling at the same time. Thank you very much. Any other questions on this? No, okay, so we've got... Um, so again, I'm happy to propose it. Do I have a seconder for this one? Councillor Davenport Ray, thank you. So we've got uh, two recommendations to agree the scope of activity to inform a strategic infrastructure delivery framework and to allocate the budget of 130,000 in 23-24 to the work in line. Yeah, so the spatial framework approved budget line in the MTFP to progress the work. Okay, thank you. Everyone agree? Yep, thank you very much indeed. And moving on to 
um, our agenda plan. Um, so depending on the outcome of the next, uh, of the next item, um, I'd just like to state at this point, as we may have to move into private session after that discussion between officers and myself, the July meeting will be cancelled. Um, and the item that was due to come then will be moved to September agenda. It was a one agenda item, and I don't imagine any of you would appreciate spending another sunny day indoors when you don't have to. Um, and further items will be added in due course. Are you all happy on... Is everyone happy with the agenda plan? Yep. Okay. Yep. We were going to add to it, weren't we, that regular regular yep. report? Got report. that? Okay. So... Um, so moving on, there's an exempt appendix in the next report, which has been circulated to members separately. If we refrain from discussing the detail contained within this exempt appendix, we can remain in public session. Or if any member wishes to freely discuss the information, please indicate now, and we'll take a vote on whether to move into an exempt session. Can we just clarify what might put us into, into exempt session, please? Um, if members want to freely discuss what was circulated in that exempt okay. appendix, so mention and names and money and, and, things and like figures that. and things like that, then right. um, then we would need to move okay. into private session. Um, what do members feel? Are you, were you are you happy with the recommendation as set out in the report, or do you want to discuss it? You might. Yes, uh, Councillor Davenport Ray. If I've followed the paper trail correctly, this decision has already been made, and with this, we are noting it. Or am I? Is that incorrect? Um, um, the, so, the so, yes. Thank you very much, Nick. Um, the decision on that for the next item, it, there won't be a decision. It will just be to note a decision that has been made by the chief executive and then presented to board. So this uh, decision was made um, with my, with you know, I was fully informed about what was going on, and I was fully supportive of the, of the decision that was made. So, anybody want to discuss it? No. Okay. So we, all members, note note the report. Okay. Okay. With that, which I think brings us uh, to housing loans. Hang on. No, no, we've done that. No, we're jumping ahead. So I think we're are we done. We're done. Well, that's... Well, it, yes, Chair. The, 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 um, re, the housing loans update report is a oh, yes. standing item on, on committee, yep. and the exempt item was part, part of, that of that paper. Okay. So everyone's happy, happy with that? All right. Jolly good. So next meeting to be, to be arranged. Thank you very much indeed, everybody. Um, you now know who your kind of points of contact are. If you have any queries in the, in the meantime, thank you very much, Adrian. Thank you, Nick. Thank you, Caroline. Thank you, Joanna. Thanks all for coming. So before midday, that's good. All right, thank you. Good over.